Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Federal Infrastructure Investments webinar. Uh, this is a unscheduled webinar, and we're uh, providing some information uh, that has recently come along in uh, the legislative session um, that uh, pertains to investments that can help continue the bike boom here in the United States. Of course, as always, we want to thank our members for their support. We couldn't do our great work in Washington, D.C. and beyond without your support. Um, if you are interested in becoming a People for Bikes member as a member of the coalition, uh, please reach out to me at Eric B. at peopleforbikes.org. I want to introduce our two presenters for today. Uh, should be two familiar faces on all of our federal webinars. We have uh, Charles Cooper, who is the managing director for the Signal Group and our lobbyist here at People for Bikes, and Noah Banian, our federal affairs manager at People for Bikes, uh, who is on the ground every day working with legislators to create better and more sound policy for biking uh, in the United States at the federal level. The agenda today is pretty short. We're going to be going over some recent infrastructure proposals in Congress, what that means for the bike business, uh, reviewing the current political landscape and the potential outcomes of these recent infrastructure proposals, and then show you some, uh, some resources and actions that you can take as a bike business to help provide some momentum behind these recent infrastructure proposals. Uh, and finally, as always, we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers at the end. Uh, and with that, I will pass things over to Charles. Great. Thanks so much, Eric, and thanks for, for having uh, us on again and look forward to the conversation that follows. I think before we get started, since this is about our work in Washington, D.C. and before Congress, um, I wanted to quickly pay tribute to John Lewis, who, as all of you know, is a, was a member of Congress from Georgia and served in Congress since 1987. And he was laid to rest today uh, after lying in state in the Capitol for two days. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows that he was a huge civil rights icon and uh, probably most well known for, for leading protesters across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965 on March 7th. And uh, since today he's being laid to rest on behalf of People for Bikes, I think we we really just wanted to pay tribute to what a wonderful human being he was and for all he did, not only in Congress, but for, for our society more broadly. And with that, I am going to pass it off to Noah, uh, Noah to talk a little bit about the recent infrastructure proposals in Congress. Thanks, Charles. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so some of you may uh, be familiar if you're following the conversation in Washington, D.C., uh, just at the beginning of the month, um, the House uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Committee put out a, a really impressive transformative um, transportation bill. And this is a bill that will fund the next five years of transportation policy and projects. Um, so every um, and of course, surface level bikes, autos, everything like that. Um, this is something we've been anticipating for a while, given that the current um, statute status of transportation funding is set to expire at the end of September. So it's just in, just two months from now. Um, so it's important that Congress is moving. There's certainly pressure to to reauthorize funding before the deadline, um, and we'll we'll get to what the likelihood of all of that is later on in this webinar. Um, but just some highlights from that transportation bill, which was then uh, looped in and included in a broader infrastructure package. And we say an infrastructure package, that means everything from transportation to broadband, water resources, housing, um, energy. So this is a massive, massive package of policies and funding um, that was almost uh, Exclusively written by Democrats and was passed on a party line vote essentially by Democrats. So it's certainly not bipartisan and uh, we'll, we'll get to its likelihood in the Senate and, and in a bipartisan arena. But again, just some quick highlights that we have here. Um, funding for all programs where bikes are eligible or bike infrastructure and facilities are eligible increases um, with these proposals, which is something that people for bikes 
our um, industry members, our advocacy partners have been pushing for the past you know, several years, knowing that this was coming down the line. So it's exciting to see these proposals heard um, and put, put in paper in this, in this past legislation or house past legislation. Um, what's also really inspiring and hopeful about this bill is how much it invests and focuses on programs related to reducing the impacts of climate change, enhancing safety for all road users, funding for uh, connectivity programs. And when we say connectivity, it's infrastructure specific to bridging the gaps between our bike facilities. So making sure that if you want to get around town safely by bike and not have to go in high stress areas, high traffic areas, you have the places that have bike lanes that are protected, uh, pathways, et cetera. Um, and, and so there's a specific new program included in the infrastructure package that's um, been championed by our friends and partners at the Rails to Trails Conservancy. And we're very excited to support um, their, this proposal. It's nearly 250 million for a year uh, for connectivity style grants. Um, a little bit further outside the transportation realm, but super exciting for the bike industry is that um, this bill, the infrastructure package, uh, reinstate and expand bike commuter benefits. Um, obviously working and just the status of work in the United States is, is all over the place right now, but more and more people are returning to work. Essential workers have been going this whole time and a lot of them have been taking to bike more so than normal. We know that there's a bike boom happening right now. So finding new ways to, um, to incentivize biking and putting money in the pockets of people who are doing work and helping keep our nation going um, by opening their businesses where, where that's uh, appropriate and allowed and, and the essential workers that are maybe trying to find socially distance efficient modes of transportation, um, expanding the bike commuter benefit to include bike share memberships and e-bikes as well is, is an important, important piece of policy that uh, we and our partners have been pushing for again, you know, for years. It's, it's been a while, I think since 2017, since there was any type of um, commuter benefit for, for biking. And then lastly, this bill recognizes um, for the first time at the federal level, the three different classes of e-bikes, um, and it matches the model legislation that we and our state partners have been pushing at the state level. Um, so as, as with many things in the federal government, um, it's been outdated for a long time, the e-bike definition. And while this wouldn't be binding necessarily, it's, it's a great first step if, if this is ultimately included in in a Senate passed in version as well to getting um, the three class model definition recognized and supported at the federal level um, so that there can be less confusion and discrepancies among states in their e-bike regulations. We can move on, thanks. Um, I'll hand over to Charles to talk about another awesome, uh, slightly infrastructure related win in Congress. Great, thank you, Noah. Uh, in addition to the to the positive movement on on transportation bill and infrastructure, uh, Congress on both sides of the Capitol, the House and the Senate, has passed a bill called the Great American Outdoors Act, and it's expected to be signed into law early next week uh, by the president. This bill is probably one of the more historic bills in the public lands and outdoor recreation space. Uh, that will have moved through the legislative process in in many decades, some would say since the Land and Water Conservation Fund was created in 1964. But this bill would do two really important things. The first is it would uh, add roughly, um, not, it would add $900 million every year for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. and uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Land and Water Conservation Fund, it's essentially a program geared towards conservation and outdoor recreation. And on the federal side of the program, they acquire lands 
And on the state side of the program, they uh, have a number of different projects, including creating local parks, creating local trails, et cetera. And so the Land and Water Conservation Fund and having a consistent $900 million every year um, will go a long way. The program, unfortunately, has faced a lot of the money in the past being diverted to other unrelated programs. So this will ensure that the full $900 million is, is dedicated towards, uh, towards the uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund, both on the federal level and on the state level. We are hopeful that this will create uh, better infrastructure locally for people to get outside, including on bikes. And given the uh, significant increase in the number of people that are that are looking to outdoor recreation for health and wellness, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, this is a very timely uh, reform in Congress to make sure that funding is available to help re respond to those trends. Uh, we expect this to, to significantly change the landscape on the local level as it relates to getting outside and being able to uh, bike and hike and, and just uh, en enjoy what, uh, what local parks have to offer. The other side of the bill would help bring in a significant amount of money to reduce the maintenance backlog on public lands. On all federal lands, there's an increasing backlog, billions upon billions of dollars, that essentially uh, is a result of just maintenance not getting done because of budget shortfalls. This is everything from facilities to trails. Um, it's, it's diminishing the visitor experience in some places and certainly re reducing uh, the experience for people that are very focused on using public lands for outdoor recreation. This would dedicate billions of dollars to reduce that over five years. We're really excited about that. It's the first time of significance that Congress has moved to help reduce the backlog. It's a huge priority for all outdoor groups, including people for bikes. Uh, and reducing the backlog, in addition to a significant amount of money dedicated to land and water conservation fund, outdoor recreation and conservation programs. Uh, it's a significant win. We expect the president to sign it maybe as early as Tuesday of next week, and then it will be law and the, uh, the funds will start moving down to the states or the federal land units, depending on what program it's going for. It's uh, really exciting. People for Bikes, first of all, wants to thank all the people uh, within their network and uh, the organizations and individuals that have uh, reached out to Congress in support of this and helped in that effort. And also a, a big congratulations to People for Bikes leadership and NOAA and others who've been on the ground working uh, to get this bill across the finish line. It's a, it's a massive win, an historic win for outdoor recreation. So with that, I will turn it back uh, over to you all. Thanks, Charles. Um, so, uh, moving back into the transportation space and what, although, you know, it's, it's tough to be in the business of predictions um, and, and outcomes, but anyway, um, so when we talk about the transportation bill and the infrastructure package, you know, it would be lovely if we could just put a bow on it and see something pass before the end of September when current funding is set to expire. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's usually not that simple in Congress. So uh, this requires, a, you know, a Senate approval. And last year, last summer, the Senate passed their own version of a transportation bill. Um, the numbers themselves and the funding were more than current levels are. Um, we saw a 40% increase in the Transportation Alternatives Program, um, which is the largest federal, apologies if you hear a dog, largest federal source of funding um, for bike infrastructure. Um, so that 40% increase is great and that compares just just for one example that compares to a 60 percent increase about a 60 percent increase of what we're seeing in the house version um and and one other thing to note uh, a difference between the senate and the house is that the senate did pass um 
unanimously out of the Environment and Public Works Committee. Um, it was bipartisan, it was supported uh, members of both sides of the aisle in that committee and drafted together. Um, it also included a climate title and some other really new and bold proposals for bikes, um, but that has not moved through the Senate floor. Um, it was think thought that it might this summer, it's possible still that that version um, gets floor time, but the Senate schedule is, uh, as with most people's schedules, as with the House schedule, is still in flux because of changes happening with the pandemic um, and with travel being difficult. So, um, and then once that, were to have another or if, if that bill would get a vote, there would have to be a pretty lengthy um, and possibly difficult, uh, to be frank, um, conference uh, negotiation between the House and Senate on their two different versions of a transportation bill. So there's still many steps ahead. That doesn't mean there isn't work to be done now. Um, if anything, the more pressure that we can put um, on our members uh, of Congress and in the Senate to advance the policies that we've we've been pushing, we've been supporting and championing, um, will help move this process through, build the pressure that that is needed to get things moving in Congress. Um, but it's certainly we're still quite a few steps away from any final uh, presidential signature. Uh, Charles, do you want to talk a bit about what's going on now with coronavirus relief and other obstacles or or potential, you know, things between here and now and and the, the when yeah, we uh, have a transportation absolutely. bill like the election? Yeah, absolutely. The the next coronavirus bill is expected to be completed next week. Um, the House has their own version that's roughly three trillion dollars. The Senate has their version, which is $1 trillion. They're trying to organize uh, between the two bodies on what the final bill will be. And I imagine it'll be somewhere somewhere in between, but uh, they're hoping to get that completed by uh, at some point next week. The unemployment insurance provisions that were passed in a previous coronavirus relief bill expire tomorrow. So they may have to do a short-term patch on that front. Um, there's a number of of issues include everything from uh, potential payroll tax relief to funding to uh, hazard pay for essential workers and liability reform for employers that are currently being negotiated between the two sides. The public reports sort of ebb and flow on how close they are to coming to an agreement. I, I don't think they're close enough to get it this week, but they uh, they certainly will will work to try to complete it by the end of next week. The House and Senate are scheduled to go out of session for the rest of August uh, next week. They'll be back for a short time in September, then supposed to be out all of October for the election and then back after the election. So there's actually a really small window to start moving uh, legislation with a lot on the horizon. In addition to negotiating a once in every six year transportation bill that, uh, that NOAA referred to. They also need to pass funding for the for every federal agency, uh, which expires on September 30th. They need to pass all the large authorization bills for big departments like the Department of Defense. And they have a number of other sort of packages of bills that they're hoping to pass, including one for the outdoor recreation economy, which obviously we're very focused on. Um, the election is now uh, within 100 days, I believe, it's uh, in the mid 90s in terms of how many days left until the election. Only a part of that, uh, the legislative branch will be in session. So there's a lot to do in a little time. And as the election approaches, as everybody knows, and as we've said on previous webinars, the ability to get things done sort of reduces. People move into messaging mode and political mode and away from policy mode. So there's a lot to do on the policy front uh, despite the election. So hopefully we can get some of these pieces across the finish line. Great, thank you, Charles. Um, and uh, and Noah, do you want to take us through these resources and actions? If you can, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, like I said, even though we're still, you know, even just 90 or so days away from the election and we're many steps away from a final infrastructure package or transportation bill, um, there's still plenty of work to be done uh, to, to advance these policies, to build consensus and, and get some more wins. So uh, some resources available uh, on our website are, you know, we, we do a night, uh, blogs and analyses every time a new a new bill like this comes out and you can find that on our website um, and, and all of these will be linked uh, in the the email that Eric sends out after the webinar. Um, we are also you know we're constantly talking to folks uh, that are drafting these bills but we want to make sure that they're hearing from the bike industry and from the communities that will directly benefit from improved infrastructure, uh, better connectivity. So if you have a moment to spare and want to do a little bit of advocacy here to, to help make some change, uh, please always feel free to reach out to myself, to Charles, to Eric, and um, we are more than happy to, to put you to work really and, and help us out here. So we've got letters, we've got email drafts, phone call transcripts, everything like that that you can think of to help uh, connect with your elected officials and make sure that they're hearing from you about uh, your infrastructure needs and, and what would make biking better near you and, and support all these new people that are biking right now. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it for our resources. We, we put everything up on our website um, and thank you all so much for taking the time to listen in and, and help us make some change here. Great. Thank you so much, Charles and Noah, for that really informative uh, presentation. There's a lot of great information in there. Um, and yes, we will follow up with those resources to, uh, to everybody that was on the registration list. If you do have any questions for Charles and Noah, please type those in the box below um, and, and we'll read those out to them. One question that I have is um, how would this uh, new federal infrastructure package um, or these proposals um, directly affect funding for states to be able to build better infrastructure um, in their own budgets um, in for the rest of the year and, and moving forward? That's a that's a really good question, Eric. Um, you know. One, one thing about transportation funding is a big portion of it comes from the federal government. And it uh, flows through the states and the, and the local governments and, and sometimes in the metropolitan planning organizations. But, but uh, that federal money is actually uh, sent down to the states and the states handle it as well as the, the local governments. So in times like these, when state, state budgets are significantly limited across the board, uh, in local budgets, local city and county budgets are significantly limited. Funding really is extremely important, and that's why we're hoping to to be able to get uh, this federal bill passed and an infrastructure bill passed, so that it can relieve some of the pressure on states that um, who have cities and counties and local municipalities that are really focused on putting together bike infrastructure, but uh, whose own whose own own budget is is a little bit burdened by the COVID-19 pandemic. The one other piece to it is, as Noah mentioned, the, the bill includes um, some stimulus for 2021 and makes adjustments to the local match, which is also a, a benefit to local governments and allows them to leverage the, the federal funds a little bit better. Good question. I think that you addressed this in, in your answer there. Um, when, from a metropolitan planning organization perspective, um, does this money from the state then get funneled down into that organization? Um, and how will it affect their long range planning as an MPO? That's a really good question. And That's it. The, the answer, oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Charles. Maybe you can um, jump in after, once I'm done here. I appreciate it. So I think, yeah, another great question. 
uh, I would probably put two points to this. First, uh, this specific bill that we're seeing in the House does include a provision specific to the Transportation Alternatives Program um, that actually makes that funding far more accessible than it currently is uh, for localities and MPOs. Um, we know that a common complaint about TAP, despite its you know, general resourcefulness is that the money often gets caught up at the state level or it's dependent on um, MPO or state regulations, how that's funneled. And, and so a provision in this, uh, this infrastructure package would be to almost cut out, not cut out the middleman, but make that money more accessible to the actual planning agency. And whether that's the MPO or not is uh, dependent on the region. But so one, making funds more accessible makes it easier to just get plans moving more quickly and, and get you know actual construction happening. And my second part of that is, you know, we are experiencing a bike boom right now. More people than ever are flocking to bikes to their local trails, finding ways to get active, to get around locally and have some fun, maybe get a good sweat. Um, and bike shops we know are selling out too. Um, I don't think, I mean, this is in no way going unnoticed by local planning agencies. And I know if they had all the resources in the world, um, they would be addressing that and they would be finding the, um, the, the resources to create better bike infrastructure, to implement connectivity proposals. Um, and, and so I think having slightly more accessible funding with this new, um, influx of bike riders creates this really awesome momentum at the MPL level and even, you know, more granular at the city level to, to plan more for bikes. Um, Charles, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's exactly right. We'll, we'll wait and see if that makes it through, but it's a pretty big win for the localities as Noah said. Just one more here from the group. Um, when you say to show your senators how infrastructure helps your business, um, what are our options at this point without being able to bring them in and do a do a visit or or expressly show them uh, the impact of of this uh, these proposals on their business? Uh, thinking from a brand perspective um, and even down to a, a local bike shop perspective as well. Thanks, Eric. That's gets at the crux of what what we're all trying to do here. So it's a good question. Um, so I think there's a couple different things you can say depending on what type of entity you are. From the bike shop perspective and the retail perspective, you know, talking about how if if business is good, which is what we're hearing, and if if maybe imports are low or something like that too, and you're having those stresses. Um, talking to your your local representatives about that, um, telling them, I know more people are biking because my sales are up this amount. And if you've taken one look at this local trail, you'll see that it's way more crowded than it's ever been. Um, granted, that's anecdotal, at least on the part of the trail use, but People for Bikes actually has new resources and new data that we're um, collecting through our business intelligence hub. Um, so some of that is, um, I think data about ridership um, and, and trends compared to last year is available on our website. Um, again, will be linked to in the emails that we send out. And it's really fascinating to see how much um, more. I mean, ridership everywhere is increasing every day. Um, when you look, you know, this day, this month compared to last year, this time last year, you know, it's up 20, 30, 40% in some places. Um, and those numbers tell a story, especially in Congress. It's always great to be able to sprinkle that data in to make your point and say, again, how does this affect the business? It's when people have more places to ride, they're going to ride more and they're going to visit your bike shop more. Um, they'll be able to help, you know, you'll be able to help service their old bikes too if they're coming in like that uh, with, with bikes in the garage or something that they're trying to, to finally get out. Um, and then from the larger business perspective, you know, it's always, we always have to help make this connection between, okay, so transportation funding, bike business. There's the clear, you know, bikes are transportation, but there's so much more than that too. And, and showing that level 
level of prioritization and investment from the federal government is um, one, it's just helpful to build confidence in the bike industry, help sustain stability, which is, you know, greatly needed right now, especially on the, the trade side. Um, and then, um, yeah, that, that's, that's about it, I think. Awesome. Thank you so much for the information uh, of how uh, all of us can get involved in, in making these um, new proposals a uh, priority uh, for Congress. And with that, we are at the half of the hour, uh, perfect timing. Um, so thank you all so much for, for joining us today, asking those thoughtful questions and uh, in supporting people for bikes and the work that we do to make biking better for everyone. If you do have any follow-up questions that we didn't get to today, you can email both Noah and I. Our emails are on the screen there, uh, and we get back to you within the day. So uh, just let us know, and we're, we're here to help. Again, thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your week.